So in this session, we will uh, just continue where we left uh, last week. So basically last week we got uh, up to what's, what's in the assignments uh, number three. Uh, we did not do number four, which is about uh, names and people. So showing information <clears throat> in the document, uh, which is coming from other parts of the TI document, not the part which is being rendered at the moment. And then <clears throat> a second topic today, we will learn about another important um, building block in customization, namely HTML templates and uh, web components. Um, and uh, using this knowledge, we will integrate a facsimile viewer, uh, which connects to a triple IF uh, server and displays us uh, facsimiles of the, um, the pages shown. So that's the plan for, for today. Um, so let's just uh, recap uh, a, a few bits. Um, looking at uh, TI processing model syntax again, we already covered the possibility to define parameters, uh, if you remember. Um, in the XML syntax, it's relatively um, clear. There are two parameters defined for, um, say, the behavior alternate. So alternate does this pop up. You remember uh, there was this one assignment to um, change the pop up uh, for for dates. So they actually do not only show the normalized date, but a pretty prettier formatted date. And this is exactly what's what's on screen right now. Uh, so we want to use format date, the XPA function to properly format um, this uh, date uh, expression. And we're using a, an alternate for this. So an alternate is always a switch between two states. On the web, this is implemented as a, as a pop-up or pop-over. So when you mouse over, you will see this pop-up. Um, for other media formats, this doesn't work. So there. Uh, it will be rendered as a footnote. Um, anyway, important for now is that um, certain behaviors take a certain number of predefined um, parameters. <clears throat> for the alternate, that's parameter default, which specifies what to output within the text, so inline in the text. And alternate defines the pop-up to be shown. Um, it's also important to note that all behaviors, even those which do not define additional parameters, all behaviors do define at least one implicit default parameter, which is called content. So the content is what's being processed by the current uh, behavior. Um, by default, it's always set to the current node. So if you do not specify a parameter, content, um, it will always be equal to the current node. So if you are processing, say, a heading, then content will be set to this to this um, TI head element you are processing currently. However, it's also possible to set content yourself. So back to my presentation. Um, I will leave it like that. Uh, so. There's another syntactical element we, we have to learn, um, which is uh, model sequence. Uh, so normally, if you, if you have multiple models inside an element spec, then the, the default algorithm would uh, just uh, try to match each of those models. And it would apply the first one, which matches. But it will ignore the rest. So there will all, always only be one model applied. However, there are cases when actually you want to output multiple things for one element in sequence. Like for personal names or information about people, we would like to output the canonical name followed by maybe uh, date of birth, followed by uh, date of death, um, followed by a description of that person. Um, 
<clears throat> so this is where we can use model sequence because model sequence does exactly that. Um, it applies all its child models in sequence, all of them. So it uh, will not just select one model, but um, it outputs all of them. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, a model inside uh, a model sequence can also have uh, predicates. Yeah, so in, in the case we see on screen right now, um, the first model is only applied if uh, there's a preceding sibling um, element uh, of type title. Um, the second uh, model is always applied because it has no condition. So with a model sequence, you can also have nested predicates, <clears throat> which will be respected. Um, so it's possible that you can have like two models inside the model sequence, but still only one is applied. Um, okay, so far, now let's look at the, the task. So I'm switching screen to the browser. Now everything has crashed, so I need to get back to. Okay, so that's that's the current state of our document after doing all the exercises of week one. Um, so at least that's my version. Um, the next task would be to display some details about people occurring in this text. So far, we have only marked them up in orange. Like here, this Klaus Jacobi, uh, Kurt Nier. So <clears throat> those are actually purse names in, in the XML. So if we look at the XML, I do download XML, uh, scroll down, down, down. So then, for example, we have this uh, guy called Klaus Jacobi, uh, Staatssekretär in Berlin. And we can see this person is marked up with a purse name element. And uh, this purse name element even has a reference. And this uh, reference usually points to, to an XML ID somewhere else in the document. So let's just uh, search for that. Um, well, I do edit uh, find. And then, uh, yes, I want to search for this ID. And no, that's not mm, here. So we get this uh, person record in the TI header, which seems to contain <clears throat> a more extensive description of this person. So what we can see is uh, the proper name of this, this person uh, in first name type full uh, with uh, date of birth, uh, date of death. Uh, we even have a birthplace, uh, place of death. We also get a description of the person. Um, yeah, now it would just be nice if in the document, the user uh, moves the mouse over a name, um, she or he gets a pop-up with some additional information. So let's realize that. Um, going to the odd editor. We already have a rule for purse name, um, which currently only changes the color to orange. Um, now we want to transform this into, into something showing a pop-up. And as we already learned, to show a pop-up, we use behavior alternate. As I said before, alternate takes two parameters. Um, well, actually, I'm not sure if you got this part, but it takes two parameters. One is default, uh, which corresponds to um, the text, which should actually be shown in line in the text. And in this case, we just want to show the current content. Um, current content uh, in XPath uh, is usually represented with a dot. So that's like current context node. Um, a dot, that's what we want to show 
in as inline text, and then we add another parameter called alternate. And for this alternate, we want to navigate to the person record in the TI header. Um, you saw that I just used uh, this XML ID to actually search for, for this person record. And uh, we can basically do the same in XPath. Yeah? So we know that inside the text, just scrolling down to the text again, inside the text, we have person name with a ref attribute and this ref attribute points to the ID of the person record in the TI header. The only complication here is that as is custom in TI, um, this ID link has been prefixed with, with this uh, hashtag. So we need to strip that out. Um, so within the odd, we can now use the standard XPath ID function. And this takes as first argument um, the ID to look up in the document. But remember, uh, we need to strip out this leading hash sign. So we will just use a substring after, and we want ref, and we want to, but only the part after the hash. Um, then the second parameter to ID uh, has to define the context, yeah, because otherwise ID doesn't know in which context to search for the ID. And the context we want to use for this is basically the root of the document. So in XPath, there's a simple function called root, which gives you the root for the current node, which is the document itself. Okay, so far so good. Uh, we save this. And have a look at how it looks like. Yes. So if I move my mouse over Klaus Jacobi, I can now see all the information from, from the TI header. Uh, so all the, the different um, names uh, this person is known um, under. Um, I also get a link to the corresponding database record in Dodis and so on. Um, yeah. So like this, it's not, it's not nice because obviously we will need to do some formatting. So this is where um, model sequence um, comes in. Because as I just said before, uh, what we actually want to display is say um, the canonical name of the person. And uh, if there is a note describing that person, then we want to show that note as well. And we will skip the rest for, for the time being. Um, so what do we need to do for this? Um, obviously, when we are in the XML and we follow this link into the TI header, I will to repeat, just search um, again. Yeah, so if we have Klaus Jacobi, uh, then uh, there's this, this ID pointing into the TI header. And uh, if we search for it again, well, let me just search upwards. Then we have this record uh, for Klaus Jacobi. At the moment, all of this is, is being output. So we get the, all the elements just uh, in, in one sequence, um, which is why output looks a bit messy. Um, we actually want to limit this to just output the things we are really interested in. So I would say we want the first name type full and we want this little note down here to provide some information um, to the user. What do we need to do for this? Well, um, obviously, when we do this lookup processing, uh, so it stops processing at the first name down in the text and switches to process this person element here. So what we need is to add another rule for this person element so we can properly format the output. So let me, oh, I already did that actually. So I'm just deleting it. 
I mean, on this machine, I already did it. Um, so we want to add another element spec for person. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I hope I get an empty one now. No, it's still model sequence. Oh, I don't get it. I want to do this myself. Yeah, well, it won't let me. <laughs> it just keeps popping up my already filled out model sequence again. But OK, let's just walk through it. So what I did, oh, well, I could actually try to delete this. So OK. So the, what I need here is a model sequence. So I'm going to add a new model sequence. And the model sequence may have one or more um, models beneath. So I need one model to show the full name. So I'm adding this. And I want to, this to appear as a, as a block. Yeah, so it's on its, it has its own uh, paragraph. And then the important thing is that I need to tell um, the TI publisher what should go into this particular block. So, and as we already learned, uh, we can use the content parameter for, for this. So in this case, my content would be purse name type full. If we just save it like this, oh, I hope it works. Uh, one second problem now is on my this screen that I cannot see what you are writing. Um, oh, well, maybe use my mobile. So if you are writing questions at the moment, I cannot see it. Uh, I'm handling this, so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> then I can ignore it. Um, OK, we saved it. And just reload the page to see what's happening. And uh, yes, yeah, so now we are just getting, um, we are just getting the canonical name of the person. Now we also would like to add um, the description. So the way to do that is to add another model to our model sequence. And uh, this other model should appear at the end. So we are moving it down by clicking on this down arrow. And again, what we want to show is uh, the node. So we define a parameter content again and point it to the node. And, uh, we also want to appear this on a separate line, so we switch it to block. Then we do save. And check the document again. And now something weird happens, because as you can see, um, the note is somewhat there, but it is formatted as a footnote. Why is that? Well, it's output as a footnote because our processing continues with a TI node element. And the TI node element has an element spec uh, which says this is a footnote. So it does not distinguish between a footnote in the header and a footnote in the text. It's all output as footnote. So what can we do here? Well, there are two possibilities. One would be um, to actually change the spec for node to um, take this special case into account and not output a footnote. The other and for the moment more simpler way would be to just point the content parameter not to the node itself, but to its children. So then thus we, we ignore the, the node itself. Um, so let's just try that. Um, all we need to do is basically go one step further and uh, use all the children of node instead of the node itself. Um, to get on all the children, so not um, including elements and, and, and text, uh, you, you write it like this in XPath. 
So then we save. And go back, reload. And yes, there we are. So we have the name of the person followed by the note as a text. Yeah, so now we could extend this and also add more information, but we'll, we'll skip that. So that's for, for the assignments. So then let me quickly check uh, what I wanted to continue with. It's a bit more difficult now because I have to do it all on the laptop and my screen is much smaller. Um, okay. Yeah, so basically we can we can finish a uh, say core processing model at this point, um, which would also be a good uh, pos a, a good point for asking questions if you have any. No questions. I do have a question. Um, the parameters and behaviors, where are they defined and documented? Like I'm, I'm always wondering what could go there and I wouldn't really know where to look that up. Okay, um, so <clears throat> the official uh, documentation is within the TI guidelines. Um, I think we linked this from from GitHub uh, on the workshop page somewhere. Da, da, dum. Here, uh, so it's it's in a section of the TI guidelines. If you follow this link, um, then you get to the to the guidelines. So that's that's basically the official standard. So the definition of the TI processing model in the TI standard, so to say. And in here, um, if you look closely, it already lists um, the the various uh, behaviors. Um, and if you follow model, then you get a more uh, detailed description. Um, so there's this list. Yeah. So that's kind of the official list, but uh, well, it's rather short and does not explain much. So what you can also do is within TI Publisher, go to the documentation. And there, uh, if you look at processing model syntax, behaviors, um, there's this list available behaviors, which has a little bit more text um, than in the, in the specification. Yeah, so those are all the um, behaviors and their parameters currently implemented within TI Publisher. Okay, thank you. Yes, I have a question also. Um, if I got the um, the the part of the note or the, the the footnotes in another document outside of the of this one document, I just write the path um, into the parameter. Um, yes, sure. So as long as the document is also stored somewhere in exist. Um, you can always access it uh, the usual way you do it in XPath. So you would need to use um, either the, the doc function and specify the path to the document within exist, or you use the collection function and then you can specify a collection to look in. Um, yeah, those are the, the two possibilities, but you always need to start with um, either doc or collection to point outside the current document. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's then move on to the next topic. Um, I just need to switch to presentation mode again so I can show something. Okay, can you see my presentation again? Yes. Yeah. Okay, 
Um, so what we have done so far, we used uh, TI XML source documents, combined them with an odd with uh, processing instructions to achieve a custom, um, a custom display of our text. However, it's, it's just one text so far. So we are just showing the, the single text. Um, but for a real digital edition, you usually want to display several things at a time. Say you want to display the transcription to the left and the translation to the right, or uh, metadata in a separate column to the left of, of uh, transcription and translation. Or you have facsimile images which you would like to display or any other information. So you, quite often you would like to combine um, bits and pieces uh, located in the same document or even different documents at the same time on one screen. Um, so this is something we can't do so with what we have learned um, so far. And it also goes beyond the TI processing model. So the TI processing model always operates on a particular TI fragment or TI document. Um, but it does not say anything about how do you combine um, multiple uh, output from multiple documents together? How do you... Um, combine all this into a web page which uh, has more features than just displaying a text. So the third important building block we need to learn about are page templates. So basically, if you browse through um, the examples in TI Publisher, uh, yes, you will see um, examples for all the use cases I just mentioned. So transcription with translation, transcription with uh, facsimile, or all three together, then some metadata, some maps, and all this stuff. The way we do this is via page templates. So for each of those use cases, we have a different page template which rearranges things as is appropriate for this particular um, use case. And all three technologies together then uh, define what is like the custom content view um, of your edition. So if we look at one particular page template, then um, there are several components on it. And uh, we will in a moment learn why they are named like this. But basically um, what we have is like the facsimile. So here it's called pb-facsimile. Uh, um, we have two views here, which are both rendered through, through odd. We have the main text. So in this case, it's a Shakespeare drama. So we have the main text of the drama um, on the bottom in this main text column. But we also have a title uh, column just above. And this title is also rendered through, through the same ODD, but it's a different component. So if this page were live, you would see that whereas the text changes when I click uh, left, so when I click next page, the text changes, but the title always stays the same because obviously it's the same the whole time. Yeah? Um, what we also have on this page are like navigation buttons, um, represented by a component called PB Navigate, And there are many more components on this page which I have not labeled. So how does this work in, in TI Publisher? <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> during the, the past years, um, a new substandard has emerged um, within the HTML5 standard. And this substandard is called web components. So it's actually a whole family of, of, of standards of um, building blocks you need. Um, what web components basically allow you 
is to define your own HTML elements. So you all know, I hope, some HTML elements, like you use h1 for a title, you use a p for a paragraph, um, you use img for an image, uh, you have figure and other, other elements like this. They are predefined in the HTML standard. However, HTML5 also allows you to define your own HTML elements. And all that is required is that they follow a certain naming convention. Um, because all the standard elements don't have a prefix, um, your custom elements always must have a prefix, which is why um, all the TI publisher elements always start with pb uh, hyphen something. So, but um, those custom HTML elements, they are not just custom HTML elements. They also include a certain behavior and a certain way to display. So if we look at the standard HTML elements, it's clear that say um, the heading element h1 to h6, um, they define a certain behavior. Yeah, so it's clear semantically that this is intended to be a heading um, <clears throat> on a certain hierarchical level within the document. That's the semantics being expressed. But there's also um, a certain way to display this um, being expressed in the in the element. And custom elements are just the same. So. But, but there's no predefined semantics or no predefined um, behavior behind them, but you have to define that, um, which is what we did in PTI Publisher. So we um, have a number of components, custom HTML components, which have a predefined behavior, and this is being used to assemble each page. Um, one important feature of uh, this web component standard or custom HTML standard is that basically all those elements, they are, they behave like monadic entities. Yeah. So you don't know what's inside. You cannot look inside if you are a web browser. Yeah? You cannot look inside. They are completely encapsulated. The only way they communicate with the outside world is through a defined interface. So I often also like to describe this like Lego blocks. Yeah. So each block has a defined size and from outside it looks all the same. However, each of the, those blocks also has an interface through which it can interface with other blocks. Those are the pins on top. Okay. So for Lego blocks, there are only six pins. Um, for yeah, uh, web components, obviously there can be more. But it's important to note that um, from outside, this element is just a, a black box. You don't know anything about, and you don't need to know anything about. All you need to know is that it has an interface through which it can communicate with other elements. Um, yeah, so for the web developers among us, it's also important to note that web components are not just a library, not just another JavaScript library or so but they are actually part of the HTML5 standard. And most of the basic technologies which enable them are by now implemented by all major modern browsers. So Safari, Firefox, Chrome, even Edge um, implement uh, the important parts of this standard. Which means that web components basically work everywhere. Um, there won't be any conflict, so you can integrate them into your existing web page without much of a, of a problem, um, which is uh, documented um, and also demonstrated in, in TI Publisher documentation. Okay, so what are the web components in, in, in Publisher? Um, I already said that I like to imagine them as a box of Lego blocks which have a defined interface and can be combined. Um, so we tried to make sure that all the web components in Publisher 
are somewhat really independent. So they can be freely moved around on a page, rearranged, recombined. You can also extend them if you like. And uh, they communicate mostly via signals. Yeah. Um, however, in TI Publisher, you may have well, you may have multiple texts on one page. You may have the transcription. You may have the translation side by side. So obviously, if you send out signals, you need to indicate where the signal should go to. So all the TI Publisher web components, they, they also have channels. So they listen on channels. So you can send a signal into the translation channel to tell the translation component that please, it should now update and move to the next page. So those are just the basic concepts, a bit of theory. Now we will go more into the practice, which is actually quite straightforward, I think. Um, yeah, but let's just look at, at another example page. And um, here I listed really all the um, web components being used. As I already explained, they all start with PB hyphen something. And uh, this is the TI Publisher documentation. And you can see the most important component, which actually displays um, text via um, the ODD. That's PB view. Uh, within the documentation, it's used in two places. We use it for the main text, obviously but we also use it for those little breadcrumbs, which will adjust when you navigate through the document. Then we have PB Navigate, which is used for those page next, previous page navigation buttons. We have um, the sidebar, which displays the table of contents. And that's realized by another generic component called PB Load. And we have PB Zoom, which are those uh, Zoom icons. Uh, we have PB search, PB lang to, to select uh, the display language, and finally PB log in to log in, log out. Now you just have to imagine that all these are little Lego blocks, and basically you can now go and just move them around. Yeah, so if you prefer to have the table of contents to the right, then just move it there in the HTML. Um, if you prefer to have a different kind of navigation buttons, then you can just also move them anywhere and the page will adopt. And this is what we are going to look at now. Um, let me switch screen again. Back to my browser window. No, come on. Oh. Okay, back to our playground. And uh, one second, let me quickly see what I wanted to start with. Yeah, flexibility. Okay, so. That's the current state of, of things. Uh, if we select the right odd. So that's our current display. Now in our document, we do have links to um, facsimile images, um, which are available on a IIIF server. So I guess most of you somehow have heard of IIIF. It's the standard protocol for um, displaying high resolution images. Um, widely used, I think, in humanities and elsewhere. Um, so what we want is to integrate this facsimile view into our page. As I already said, the first step would be um, to change the HTML template of this page. However, instead of just changing it, we can also reuse one of the already existing ones. So like the Shakespeare document, already has this uh, split view. And actually, if you go to the sidebar, then you can try and just apply uh, the Shakespeare. Where is it? Yeah, so if we apply the Shakespeare HTML template, we already get this kind of um, split view with the text to the left and the facsimile viewer to the right. 
Um, unfortunately, at the moment, this doesn't work yet because obviously for the facsimile viewer to display a facsimile, we need to somehow inform it um, about the facsimiles we want to see. Um, the viewer cannot know by itself uh, what images we, we have. Um, so what I would like to do now is just to create uh, my own new HTML template for Dodis by copying the Shakespeare template and then adopting it. Yeah, and uh, for the exercises, you may want to do the same yourself. So basically the template I'm using is this facsimile HTML and I want to just copy it. So what I will do is um, I go to Excite because for, for this operation, there's no uh, simple way in TI Publisher implemented yet. So we go to Excite, which can just copy files. And uh, we click on Open, navigate to Apps, TI Publisher, and then all the page templates are in templates pages. So, and there's the one used by Shakespeare, which is called facsimile HTML. So I just opened that. And uh, I only need to do one, two things. Like um, I want to have a proper title or description being displayed in my list of, of available templates. So I will change this to um, say, Wolf store this template. And yeah, that's, that's it. And then I just do file save as and say I save it as uh, though this wolf.html. So this will be my new HTML template. Um, if we look at the HTML itself, yeah, you can see it's actually a rather short file. It only has like 80 lines and um, it's standard HTML. It's um, any web browser will understand it immediately. It's just that it uses those custom elements. Yeah, and we do recognize the ones starting with PB hyphen, like PB page. Um, or we recognize the PB view, um, which in, in this case um, actually applies an XPath. So it, this is the one for showing the, the heading, the title. Um, whereas the, the main one is down here. So here we have uh, this main element and it contains a PB view for the text itself. Plus it contains this PB facsimile, which is our facsimile viewer. We leave it as is because it will actually work as is. We don't need to change anything further in here for the moment. We will just leave it and I won't explain all the attributes and so on. We can do that next week. Uh, so I saved it as though this wolf. And now if I go to my page again, I should be able, well, I will reload. And then I should be able to see my newly created template. Here it is. Okay, so I, now I'm using uh, my ODD plus my template. Okay. Um, well, it still does not look very promising because we are still missing the actual facsimiles. Um, so where do we find them? If we look at the XML, the TI, um, if we look at the TI, then we may notice that after the TI header and before the main text uh, block begins, we have this list of facsimile images actually. Yeah, so in TI, there are various ways to, to define facsimile images and to reference them. Um, quite often you would put a fax, a fax attribute on the page break. Yeah, so if you have page by page um, facsimile images, then you would connect them via the, the PB, so the page break. However, in our case, uh, we don't have page breaks in the document. We don't know 
where the do where one page ends and the next one starts. All we have is a list of facsimiles. So what we would need to do is, <clears throat> in our art, inform the PB facsimile component that for this document, we actually have those three um, facsimile images and we would like to show them. Again, um, because this is now a communication between one web component, our PB view with another web component, our PB facsimile, yeah? uh, we need to use this signal mechanism to send a signal. So what we want to, to output is actually another web component from within our art. And this web component would be called um, PB fax link. Um, so how do we do that? Um, basically, we want to output this facsimile list right at the start of um, the, the text block being shown. What's the text block being shown? Um, so TI Publisher will actually never pass or rarely ever pass the entire TI document to um, the ODD for display because, well, TI documents tend to be rather large. So they may have hundreds of pages, um, sometimes even thousands of pages. So displaying the whole document uh, is usually not what you want. Therefore, TI Publisher um, does apply pagination. And it provides various pagination algorithms. The two most important ones are by division and by uh, page. Yeah, so if you look at the, the examples which ship with TI Publisher, um, you can find some examples which are like page by page. So for example, the, the Immanuel Kant that, that has page breaks. So um, if you walk through it, you will see the document page by page. Other documents uh, show entire divisions. And showing entire division, that's also the default and thus also applies at the moment for our document. So what the ODD gets is this outer um, div type doc, which means that we, if we want to output the list of facsimile images at the top, uh, we basically need to do this within the, this division. Yeah, so we go to the odd editor and we just overwrite the rule for uh, div. So now we want to add um, another rule on top. And we want it uh, to be limited to, um, what was it, uh, type um, div type doc. So if type, oh no, now I made a mistake. Oh. No, I did not make a mistake. It's okay. I can also do it that way. So div type talk, talk. That's where we want this to apply. And we want to output this just as an anonymous block. Okay. So, but now we want to output two things in sequence. Yeah. So remember, we could use a model sequence here. Um, Unfortunately, I made a mistake and I already chose uh, an, an, a normal model instead of a model sequence. But doesn't matter, I can also do it with just a normal model. Um, what I can do is I specify parameter content and then point it to those two things I want to output. So what I want to output is um, the facsimile list to which I well, which is um, between the TI header and the TI text element. So it sits in between. So I need to go out of the current context. So again, I do root dot and then just facsimile. This gives me my facsimile element. But then I also certainly want to output the current content of the division. Yeah, so myself at this very point. Uh, and again, uh, the placeholder for, for uh, self is the dot. 
And we put parentheses around this expression. Um, so it's clear that we have a sequence of two things to be output. So that's another way um, to specify a sequence if you want to avoid uh, using model sequence. Um, OK, so we have this little bit. Um, but now we would end up on facsimile, and we don't have any specification for facsimile yet. So we need to have another rule there. Um, but actually, we are not really interested in facsimile at all, are we? Um, well, in fact, we, we can directly jump to the graphic. Oops. Uh, let's look at XML again. Um, yeah, we just have facsimile, and then we have graphic one, graphic two, graphic three. So the facsimile element doesn't actually help us. We don't want to output it. Uh, so we can directly jump to the graphic children of facsimile. And then we can add a rule for graphic, where we will actually output the link to the facsimile. So add another spec for graphic. And you can see this already has a default um, model, which just outputs, um, surprise, surprise, an, an image, a graphic, using graphic behavior. Um, and But we want to add another one, which does not output the image like this, but um, as uh, this web component link, PB fax link. So basically, um, what we want to output is um, yeah, um, an HTML element, which would look like, uh, let me write this just somewhere. Um, it would look like this, oh, pb fax link, and then it would have fax. And in there, we need the name of the name of the image we are linking to. Plus, I told you about this um, signal mechanism, which always needs to go into a particular channel. Um, and in fact, each element does have this. Uh, so here you can see our, our text. So that's the PV view. Um, sorry that I have to scroll to the end, but oh, I can maybe reformat it like this so it gets a bit clearer. You see, you have a lot of properties on, on those elements. Um, but as I said, they are um, those, those attributes, they are the interface of the component. So the component is entirely configured via those attributes. Um, for this communication mechanism, what's important is that our text view, the PB view, it has this subscribe emit. So those are the channels it actually listens and talks to. So subscribe means I listen to a channel called transcription because I am the transcription. And I also emit signals into this channel called transcription. And likewise, our PB facsimile has subscribed transcription, which means it listens to um, signals being sent from the transcription or from anything else in the same transcription channel. So what we need to do is to also tell our facsimile link that it should please um, emit into transcription because that's what our transcription, uh, our facsimile view is listening to. Um, yeah, so basically that's the HTML we want to output. Um, so now there are different ways to do it, but a very simple one is we actually use a template. Um, templating is uh, an extension TI Publisher implements. So that's not part of the TI processing model specification. However, when working on real world projects, um, 
like, uh, for example, Schweizerische Rechtsquellen. Uh, we figured out that at some point it's very difficult to generate more complex uh, structures um, via the default behaviors. So you need a way to extend the default behaviors. And a simple way to do that is by allowing um, a template to be specified. Yeah. So a temp the template in this case for HTML can be arbitrary HTML. Um, but it also comes handy if you are, for example, generating um, tech output for, for a print publication, because there you often also have quite complex um, prologues uh, spanning like dozens of lines, which you need to, to define um, font sizes and all that stuff. So what we will do here is just paste this um, HTML we want as output into the template. And then uh, this bit should be dynamic. Yeah, so we don't want to have a fixed image link here, but we want to use um, the link provided in the parameter. So we delete that and we replace it with a parameter expression. Um, if we look at our XML of the TI document, then the link is given in attribute URL. So what we do is we add a parameter. Uh, yes, URL is okay. And this gets just content of the attribute URL. And then we add this in the template as a, as a parameter, as a placeholder. And the placeholders here in our templating are always specified with those two um, brackets. Yeah, so that's basically that's basically all we need, I think. Um, we will just try it out. I save. And I go to my TI publisher again. And oh, where is it? There it is. So we have successfully integrated our facsimile view. Um, it's important to note here that uh, this viewer component, it talks to a triple IF server. Um, so for sure the facsimile already needs to be available on that server. Um, but this is uh, also configurable because actually, if we look at our HTML template, uh, where is it? Then you can see that here it says base URI um, app6solutions.com cantaloupe triple IF version two. Yeah, so that's that's the URI pointing um, to a triple IF server we are we are running on a different um, machine. Okay. Yeah, so this was a lot of new stuff. I guess there must be some questions. Uh, so please ask, it's a good moment. Uh, yeah, I would have a question about uh, saving in the templates folder. Uh, actually, I was setting up this on my machine with Docker and uh, there is an, the owners is TI and the group is TI, but the TI demo is not allowed to write uh, in that folder. Is that oh, possible? okay. So I can't save it. Okay, good good point. Um, so in in my case, I actually was logged in as, as admin, <laughs> uh, which is why it worked, but yes, you are right. So before you can save, you would need to log in. Uh, you can also, because TI demo is definitely not allowed, but you can also use uh, TI and the password is simple. So just simple uh, lowercase. And uh, you should also be able to save as this user because that's the owner. So any other uh, questions? Yes, about the IIIF integration. 
uh, the base URI and the the addition from the the XML that made sense to me. But uh, IIIF also has these parameters that can be specified. Where would they go? Um, well, at the moment, uh, I think we are we are not passing. Well, the so okay, we are using this client component. Um, in here, which is uh, what's the name, Open C Dragon, and this client side component, so the the actual uh, the actual uh, view, which also uh, implements like uh, zoom in, zoom out, and all that stuff. So this is passing um, the actual triple I F parameters. Um, from outside, uh, we just configure a few um, a few parameters. In fact, uh, you can look up uh, all the web components and the interface they defined via the TI Publisher documentation. So if you go to uh, documentation and then web components API. Um, so that's, that's more for advanced uh, users who really want to tweak things. Um, so everyone else does not need to listen at this point uh, we will come back to it later um, okay it takes a while because it's loading from an external server okay so those are all the the web components ti uh, publisher um, consists of and provides and if we look at pb facsimile you can see that it has various um, attributes defined uh, so like you can switch on or off uh, the full page control. Uh, you can enable, disable rotation and so on. So there are various parameters accepted here. I think PB fax link um, as only parameters defines uh, the, the fax attribute. So that's the role of the, the URL of the image um, plus coordinates. So you can pass in coordinates if you would like a certain rectangle to be highlighted. Um, yeah, but for the moment, those are all the IIIF parameters uh, being supported. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, otherwise, uh, we would basically be done for for today. Um, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, just a question um, about the channels. Is there an impact of the num the numbers of channels on the performances, or is it completely uh, of a scope? Um, now, so far, I have not seen any impact, um, but okay, uh, I mean, in, in real world examples, I'm still using uh, at most, say, three, four channels per page. Um, there, I have not seen any impact. Um, however, uh, a lot is going on asynchronously, so elements also need to wait for each other, like, for example, the PB facsimile component should wait for the text to be actually loaded. Yeah, so it will not become active and will not respond to signals un until the, the text has been fully loaded. Um, yeah, so, but this is just because all the communication on the page is going asynchronously. Yeah, so you have to imagine all those components are like little guys sitting on the page constantly talking. And uh, yeah, so this is all asynchronous. They are talking at the same time, and sometimes um, you need to make sure that they, they wait for each other um, before they talk. OK, but how do you do it when you do you have some advice when you are thinking about your template? Uh, do you draw it by hand on a draft paper, or do you draw blocks to be very sure or is it very clear in your head how would you 
advise some people who are not accustomed with these uh, web components to uh, design their templates for a start? Um, yeah, so, so first of all, it's, it's important, I think, that you get familiar with, with the concept. Yeah, so I know a lot of people have not worked with actual HTML pages yet. But in fact, uh, all our templates, they are rather simple. And compared to, to other HTML projects, they are really um, short and concise. And the web components are not that difficult to understand. Um, so with using web components, you need to familiarize yourself, uh, which is why for, for this week, um, there's also one additional exercise, which is a bit more difficult, uh, where we would like to embed metadata about the document in a separate column. So that would be a separate web component. Um, yeah, so with, with the web components, it takes some time to get familiar, but then after a while, you understand that basically by copy and paste, yeah, you, you can achieve uh, most of, of what you want without actually reading the documentation. I mean, I, I do copy and paste myself, obviously. Um, the other bit is that for sure, the components are just one bit, um, but how the, the page is displayed to the user, so the, the, the presentation uh, layer, yeah, with, with the styling and how things are arranged. Um, that's a, that's a different issue and it's more about design and more a conceptual issue than a technical issue. And there I do think that it helps uh, to actually draw things on paper first. Yeah, and I mean, all web designers I know uh, would also draw it on paper first um, just to get a feel for how do you want your page to actually look like in the end and how does the user interact with it? Okay, thank you for the advice. But I was talking about drawing about the communications between channels because when I tested it, I thought uh, I was up with myself uh, being not very familiar with these communication just to know wow. which part must listen to what part. Uh, what would be your advice for? Uh, to to help uh, being okay with the process and don't forget anything. Um, yeah, I would I would need to know the into which problem you were actually running. Um, mm -hmm. So I think looking looking at the examples we provide, uh, you already get a right range of of possible communication. Um, channels or, or pipelines. Um, yeah, so I would I would need to, to actually see it um, to help here. Normally it's not it's not a big deal. Um, I mean I normally have like two or three channels. I have one for the transcription, I have one maybe for a translation, um, one for the, the facsimile. Yeah, and but I don't really need more. Um, yeah, so you should probably show us uh, the, the concrete um, example to better understand. Okay. We had one more question in Slack about uh, IIIF. Uh, integration when um, uh, when there there's an image resource already hosted uh, somewhere maybe Giuliano can e explain himself best what he meant hello Giuliano can you hear us
Okay, his microphone doesn't work today, but Wolfgang, maybe you can read in the in the Slack channel. He was um, Juliana was uh, pasting an example of Triple uh, IF server uh, that serves manifest JSON, and how would you integrate a resource? Um, yeah, so I was just reading it. Um, uh, basically, what you specify um, as space URI, um, that's the part of the triple F, triple IF URI um, before the, the manifest part, I think. Um, let me just quickly check. Uh, one second. Um, where is the manifest? Ah, here. No. There. Uh, yeah. Okay, I need to. <laughs> I, I have a. I will paste the link in the in the slide. Basically, if if you if you use a, um, a URL like this, uh, this is where how you can get to the actual actual image. So you need to figure out which part of the of the path is really responsible for producing the significant portion uh of the link to an actual image file and then use odd to generate uh to generate what you need to access uh, yeah. yeah so in, in this case it would probably be the part of the url up to the triple if mm -hmm. and uh yeah parameters uh you do not uh, specify directly in this URL because that's the job of the uh, the image viewer on the client side. So Open C Dragon we are using um, does automatically then handle all the other parameters like uh, yeah which fragment you want to see and so on. I have another question. Um, namely, if you have images on different triple IF servers, you will need different base URIs. Is that possible to make that dynamic as well? Um, I think uh, yes. Uh, at the moment, it would be possible to uh, pass in the full uh, link to the manifest um, inside the um, inside the PB fax link uh, fax attribute. Yeah, and then, then this, if, if this is an absolute URL, then it would overwrite the base uh, URI. Okay, thank you. Okay, so one, one problem uh, which I think the facsimile viewer does not handle, and at the moment is, um, yeah, if if you have uh, a paginated image, yeah, so like one one resource which has page zero, page one, page two, um, I think this is at the moment not possible. We are um, assuming that uh, there's one image per page available. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, um, yeah, I would say uh, try your your luck on the on the assignments. Um, so there, let me go to that page again. Mm. So. 
uh, we still had some oops we still had some assignments left from from last week uh, so basically today we started at um, assignment number four 4.1 display details about people so i would suggest that you try yourself to um, redo this uh, just to get familiar um, with the processing model some more um, then we have uh, using model sequence so that's what we all also discussed today and uh, there's this optional exercise which is about showing metadata from the ti header um, this is optional so you don't really need to do it um, but it will come in handy uh, for the other uh, assignments for today which are in the in the second file uh, so there's this week two assignments and here I describe again how to display a facsimile I would suggest that you try yourself to uh, reproduce this um, I know it can be a bit difficult, so please do not hesitate to ask questions on Slack if you get stuck. Um, and there's the second assignment for, for those who already managed to facsimile view. Um, so this assignment would be about uh, embedding additional metadata in a separate um, column uh, to the left of the, the main text. Okay, yeah, so then that's basically it for today, unless uh, there's questions about assignments now. No, yeah, then I uh, wish you, uh, yeah, good luck with the assignments and hope you can cope with them um, easily. Um, otherwise, just contact us on Slack and uh, ask questions. Yeah, thank you very much for attending and see you next week.